Yes, we've got Dundee's most second handsome player ever, Gavin Ray. How are you, mate? I'm good, mate. Thank you. You know who I've got us first? Who? Susan Boyle's boy, Martin. <laughs> the wee man. He's a legend. Oh, yeah, I was speaking to him this morning, actually. He says, uh, ask of the best bit of advice he ever gave us. Can you remember it? Nah. He said, <laughs> you say to him, oh, wee man, see if you work hard, you'll have a bank balance like mine. <laughs> no, I never. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's doing well, isn't he? Boyley has done unbelievable, mate. Since when, like, when we started, obviously, I, I, when I was at Aberdeen, he came on trial from Montrose, and he was an out-and-out striker. And then he came to Dundee. Obviously, he signed with Dundee, and then I ended up back at Dundee. And like, he was in and out of the team. I'm, I'm taking credit for his for his career, by the way, because I was coach, head coach of reserves, um, like coaching the reserves manager. And he was like playing up front, and then I said, "You know what? We'll, we'll chuck you wide because he's so fast." And I'm just thinking, "We'll put him wide, see how he goes." He was amazing, and since then, that's just been his position. So I'm taking all credit for his career. <laughs> Bro, he actually said that in the under twenties games that you would just come in my box of donuts and say to the boys, "If you win, we'll give you the donuts." Yeah, I used to give them bonuses and then run, mate. But if they didn't win, they didn't get the donuts. <laughs> <laughs> I used to point? love it, mate. It what, bonuses, as in you would give them a few quid if they won. No, like bonus. I would take in like stuff like donuts, and I would take other stuff. You know, just like bonuses for the game, like an incentive for the game. Like just try and keep it as much as just like an incentive for them to get in, because it's hard sometimes reserve games. Yeah. The, the boys that came down and played when I was coaching the reserves were brilliant. You know, they all loved it. Um, I think the fact you could bet on the games as well was. Interesting, because everyone would be asking the team. We'd have like five first team players. Everyone was just lumping on the team. It was amazing. <laughs> amazing. Uh, you're in Australia now, mate, and you're coaching it there. I am. Yeah, I've been coaching for about since I got here, like so about five years. So I was assistant coach and still playing. So I played till I was forty, semi pro level. Wow. Um, so I was playing uh, and assistant coach, and then I was he- head coach to call it here, head coach and and playing, and then of the last two years. I've just done coaching. So I've been coaching for about five years and um, two different clubs. I'm at the second club now. You know, up, ups and downs, great experience. You know, we've won, won a couple, of, well, won a cup in the top level. Uh, we also got relegated. So great experience. Uh, because nobody knows this, but the reason you actually moved to Australia was to sell Herbalife for your best mate, Lee Mayer. <laughs> He's pummeling it. He loves it. <laughs> He's actually told me that it was you that got toadfish to lose weight for neighbours. Is that true? <laughs> <laughs> oh, brilliant. Uh, you came through him, didn't you? He's obviously both started at Dundee. You were for Aberdeen. That's some come down, mate, isn't it? Going for living in Aberdeen to uh, having to move through to Dundee. Mate, I was homesick the first, first while I was there at uh, Aberdeen. Um, yeah, Mirzo was like, Mirzo's a year younger than me, or a couple of years younger than me, but, yeah, you know, same sort of YTS sort of level. Um, but, yeah, no, I've been mates with Mirzo since, since YTS days, and it's, he's a good, good guy. So what did you move into? Did you move into Diggs, Gov? Yeah, yeah. So we moved down. So I was 16 when I moved down and moved into Diggs in the Hilton. Oh, um, in the Hilton? In the Hilton, mate. It was actually a really nice place. It was actually a really nice apartment. <laughs> so we had one of the ladies that used to do like the lunches at Den's, Moira. Her daughter used to come and like cook the meals and then come in and clean, but then go away. And there was five boys there. So I think there was five boys or five or six boys in this apartment. A couple from obviously Aberdeen. Uh, a few from the West Coast and a couple from uh, Edinburgh as well. Um, and even just getting used to that, just being away from home and just getting used to not being, a, you know, with my folks. It was I had struggled that first year, really struggled um, with the football, but also just being away, just I hated it. You must have seen some things on the out in there. Aye, it was, uh, it was an interesting week. <laughs> obviously, going for Dens back home, you just, you, obviously, when none of us were driving at that point, um, we used to just, like, sprint, sprint home in the apartment get back to the flat as soon as we could like just to make sure there was no trouble and we just used to just get our stuff for the local spa <coughs> excuse me and then um, just uh, bunker down in the house mate we were never far out in the Hilton like oh it's crazy man uh, Cowboy McCormick John McCormick was your youth team manager now he's notorious for being a screwball was it a tough upbringing? I was I was really tough he was um yeah, he was he was an intimidating character. Um, we used to do like anyone used to get mistakes in the youth team. If there was any mistakes in training that, or any disagreements, he used to just give like get a glove each. So we'd be back into the gym after training, and you would just chuck two boxing gloves down, 
and you just have to grab the gloves. So somebody get the left and somebody get the right. So you're just thinking, fuck, I need to get, I need to get the right. But, but, yeah, it was, it was mental, mate. Well, I'm just out of school. I'm thinking I'm coming down, and then you're boxing against boys that are like a year older than you, say the West Coast, and you're like proper ballsy anyway. You're like, fuck. it's mental, mate. Mental. But, but what, yeah. would Colin McRefrit? Would he referee the boxing matches? Yeah, he loved it. Absolutely loved it, mate. Absolutely loved it. It was, it was just his, his thing, like. He proper like tested you as a as a character to try and like get you get you out of your shell, and I was like I was quite quiet like as, as a 16, 15, 16 year old going into that. It was a it was a tough and challenging environment. I hated my first year, mate. I was really struggling. I used to get like when it was a Sunday night in Aberdeen, I used to go to get back down the road on the Monday morning. I was dreading it, mate. I hated it because I was struggling with football as well. So it was like getting used to that environment plus the football. Proper struggling. And hated it that first year. Um, Why were you struggling football wise? What, no, no playing well? No, nah, I was, yeah, it was terrible, mate, if I'm honest, like absolutely hopeless. Um, I came into it and like there was a lot of boys that were in their second year YTS. And so I was just new to it, totally out of my comfort zone, totally struggled, no confidence. And it wasn't until the, towards the end of that year that I started to get to grips with it and started to like, feel a bit more confident in myself and start, I nicked a couple of goals towards the end and then I started feeling better but I was I, mean, I wasn't playing I was on the bench plus you've got all the getting used to you know doing the YTS stuff and all that as well so I didn't didn't really particularly enjoy that first year um, but luckily it, it sort of picked up after that See because you had that struggle early on Gav do you think that stood you in good stead for the rest of your career? Definitely because you know I'd been through a tough time you know I hadn't had it like it was all easy it was like it was really tough that first year and I was really close to like not getting that second year YTS, like for sure I would have been struggling. You know when you go and you line up and you, you get told whether you're getting kept on or you're getting let go. Horrible experience and obviously a lot of my mates get let go and luckily I've done enough. But because I've been through that tough time, you know, even throughout my career you always go up and you have tough times and you have good times. And it just, because I'd done that already, I'd sort of known what it was like. So you just become more resilient from the off. So I was more resilient from the off at that point and, managed to sustain a career just through hard work and determination and just being able to be resilient and just keep pushing on. Uh, it's mad that. Uh, Jim Duffy was the first team manager. So when did he start to take a liking to you? Did you start to do better in the youth team? Aye, towards, towards the end of the, that first year at YCS, I, as I say, I scored a couple of goals and just got my confidence. The biggest thing that happened was the end of the year when they, they tell you about, you know, if you're getting kept on. They, um, so I got kept on. They told me to go away and work on, so it was like, Fitness, obviously it would have been, I think it was heading and first touch because my first touch was horrendous. Um, so <laughs> worked in it over the summer, you know, really worked hard over the summer, worked on fitness and then came back that second year and just, just the fact that they kept me on, I just got the biggest confidence boost ever. So I played, so the second year I was there, YTS, I played all YTS games, all reserve games and first team in that second year. From that, from the first year was like, it's the biggest thing was confidence, just to give us that confidence just to have a go. It's mad that, isn't it? Like the career you've had and you, could, you didn't even have a first touch. Horrendous. It wasn't even that good when I finished, mate, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, who was your teammates back then? Is there anyone that we would know? Any of the older boys that were quite intimidating or was it not like that? Um, on the YTS, there wasn't really anyone that sustained a career. Ian Anderson was the only one that sort of, he went to Preston and he he'd done all right. He but he never like, had a really long career. Um, the ones coming through underneath me were like Lee Wilkie, um, Derek Souter, Lee Merzo, Big Jamie. Uh, Wait, Jamie can I just say, the names you've mentioned, there's no first t- touch between any of you five, man. <laughs> <laughs> Big Streaky was all right. Big Streaky was no bad. Big Streaky was, was a hard uh, bastard, wasn't he? Lee Wilkie was a hard bastard, man. Mate, when I played, so I played youth team, um, and I used to play centre-half for the youth team, and Big Streaky uh, came in, so he would have been about 15, still at school, and he was like, massive already he was like and he was such a good player for his like it was such a shame obviously he had his bad injuries but what a player he was mate well do you think he could have went like really high in football Lee Wilkie if he never got the injuries mate, he had he had everything like modern day centre half and very good in the ball he used to like do mazes out from defence and that loved it Dane turns and all that he loved it but he could actually like ping a ball he was quick enough aggressive as anything and loved defending he could date and like he was aggressive in the air he, he had everything like for a, a modern day centre half, but he obviously had a bit of a, a nightmare with injuries and 
I remember watching the game against Holland when he was against Van Nistelrooy, mate. He was unbelievable that day. He was amazing. And amazing. It's a shame because he could have went on. See, when you were young boys, Gov, would you just go to the Mardi? Mardi Gras? Mate, we went to the Mardis all the time, mate. It was mental. <laughs> mate, we went... Um, so when uh, I bought a house in Dundee, maybe... When I'd have been about 22, maybe 23 in the first team. And then Mirzo and Big Jamie stayed with me. So they were like my lodgers. They, they would pay me rent for the house. It was amazing, mate. <laughs> so we were all in the house together, out in, out in the ferry. And, oh, mate, we had, um, we had to like hit it on the head because we, we ended up going out too much. We were out, I remember one time, and I stopped going out during the week after it, we'd done Saturday, Sunday, Tuesday for eight weeks solid. <laughs> and then after that, I was just like, nah, I can't, I can't date anymore. But it was the Benettis. The Benettis were in charge. And like our training was at three o'clock in the afternoon. So it was the biggest carrot ever. You're just like, oh, well, I'll just go and then we'll sleep in and then we'll go to training. It was the worst, <laughs> thing, I, worst thing I could have done. But yeah, after that, I never drank during the week again in my career because it was just it was too much. See, just on Jim Duffy, how was he with young players? Meant to be a great coach, uh, isn't he? Yeah, good. Really good. He was, you know what? He's very, I love Duff because he's very just honest. He would tell you if you were shit. You know, he would tell you like, mate, you were hopeless today, and you were just like, nah, "All right, fair enough." <laughs> but I get, I get on the other side of that. Like, if you were good, um, he would tell you the same thing. I remember a game against at Parkhead after the game. I think we got beat. We got beat two 0 or something. But he's like, he said to me after the game, he says, "Listen, you didn't deserve to be in the losing team because I'd had a really good game." Just he was just very honest. I loved loved that about him. But intimidating. He was he mellowed out throughout his career because when I first had him that first couple of years, yeah, he was uh, he was tough, and there was some. We had some huge characters in that first team dressing room, so he had to like be really strong, and he was a strong character, so he could deal with. It. Can you remember a certain one that he, he absolutely cracked? Um, yeah, there was. Um, I remember the first team going down to the Perth races. They'd had like this day out organised, and for some reason they came back after the racing, and we there was a mad squad in the first team when I was coming through. What, like, from what sort of players? Who were talking about? So you had. Uh, Jerry Britton, Jordy Shaw, Steve Pittman, Alan Binney, Ray Farningham, uh, Noel Blake, all like mental, like mad squad. Yes. And um, they'd had this day at Perth races and um, for some reason, they'd, stole, they'd stolen the stepladder from like the finish line. You know, like the finish line, it's like a stepladder and they've got the thing, so they put the thing yeah. up on the board. They'd, for some reason, they'd stolen the stepladder and brought it back on the, the minibus back to Den's. Well, like, it's just mental, right? So the next day, obviously Duff, Duff didn't the drink. He, he hated all that. So next day, got a complaint from Perth Races. The stepladder's in the first team dressing room at this point. The boys are coming back in steaming. He gets them all in and they're still steaming. He went half as nut and like mental. And they ended up getting running around the track and that. And he was just like, oh, he that. didn't want to mess him like because he was he was tough, tough guy. Like I've heard he can fight as well. He's very possible, isn't he? He's meant to be off his nut. I've heard that as well, mate. To be honest, and I, to be honest, I wouldn't like to see him, and wouldn't like to see him in action. But even then, like we had cowboy as well, mate. He's mental and all. So, you know, you grew up. Did they do pals? Got was cowboy and Duffy pals? Yeah, yeah, they were pals, mate, and they were like, yeah, they're all mental, mate. It was a, uh, but like for a for a kid like growing up and in the YTS, it was it was great ground, and you know, dealing with having to de- not deal with these characters, but being around these characters and seeing them because it's a lot different these days. Yeah, uh, Jockey Scott, another character replaced him. Uh, any standout memories of him, except for the handlebar moustache? <laughs> the jockey was good. He was just like very. Um, I loved his training. His training was great. Him and uh, Jimmy Bone, so JB was the assistant. We had a really good group at that point, and the training was excellent. But it used to. You just remember. I can remember being in the first team dressing at that point, and he used to. The first team dressing door would be open, and the coach's door would be open, and you just hear him laughing like fuck all the time. Like the loudest laugh ever, and everyone thinks he's proper, like like a doer character, and he's like grumpy, which he can be at times. But he was proper, like great banter with the boys. He was amazing, mate. He was a brilliant coach as well. I love working with him. Uh, yeah. See, when you say that, like his training was brilliant. So, what sort of stuff did he do? Was he before his time? Uh, not so much that. It was more like it was really like short sessions, but really intense. So you'd be absolutely knackered by the end of it. But everyone loved it because it was. Not always, not always the same, but it was like you knew what you were doing every day, and but it was just really short. Work your nuts off, and then you would get the rewards from it. So you get your days off, you get time to chill out. But it was the training was really enjoyable, and his co- his actual coaching points was great as well. Um, 
and Jaiby was more of the more keeping the group going and the camaraderie between all the boys. And he was funny. He's a funny character as well. But Jockey was he was a fantastic coach as well. And I, I love working with him and work, love working with both of them, to be honest. Because he's finished fifth and seventh in Jockey's two years. Like, for me, Dundee should be biting their hand off for fifth and seventh. Uh, was it unrealistic ambitions for the board that why Jockey Scott got sacked? I, I think um, I think they'd come to this... Like, thinking back, I don't know if it was, this is exactly how it went, but... I think it was Atletico Madrid had this model where they brought in loads of boys from different countries and then played them in their first team and then sold them. And I think the Mars at that time who were in charge had the same idea when the Benetis came in. So, Jockey, I mean, we'd done unbelievable in that in that two years, you know, highest league positions, doing really well, and then he obviously got let go. So I was gutted because he was really good to me. I, as I say, I, well, I played nearly every game from that second season. Um, so I was obviously gutted, but in football you sort of look back and you learn that it happens. You know, coaches move on, but it was it was a bit it was a bit harsh, but nothing surprised him in football. See, see, at Dundee, though, like, I always feel like Dundee do have quite un, unrealistic ambitions. Like, I always yeah. think that like Dundee being in the Premier League's a success, but like fans, board, and everything since I've been a wee boy, they've always I thought had unrealistic ambitions. Would you go along with it? It's a big club, though, isn't it? And you know, yeah. like it's, and they've always had this. The last, you know, twenty years been up and down, up and down. And you know, it's a it's a club that's got huge history, and I think that's what the the expectation comes from. And it's a tough place to play if you're if it's not going well. It's it's not an easy place to play. You know, the the fans have got massive expectations, and whether it's unrealistic or not, it's I suppose it's it's it is a tough it's a tough place to play when you're not playing well, but. Um, you know, it should definitely be in the top league, so at least, the, like I probably agree, you know, it should definitely be in that league at least, but to be pushing on higher up, is uh, it can be tough because it's a tough league. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then what did you think when you heard that uh, an Amad Italian of Arno Benetti was getting it? Did, was there any, like, did the players know before it came out in the press or was, were you just surprised as everyone else when he got the job? Oh, listen, there was, there was rumours, but with no idea what was happening. And I think he came to a game at Ibrox, um, and then I remember him, I think he told um, Peter Marr at the time, oh, the boys aren't fit enough. We'd, we'd played amazing at Ibrox, like we were amazing. I, I think we'd like, it was drawn, we drew the game or, you know, it was a close game and we'd done really well, but he told Peter Marr, oh, the boys are not fit enough and we need to get them fitter, they need to lose X amount of kilos. And I was like, fuck, here we go again, man. And it was just like, very strange when they came in, but, and it was total culture shock that looking back, you get used to it, but it's really horrendous at the time, like just minging at the start, right? By the way, Italians love that, didn't they? No fit enough, need to lose weight. That's all they ever say, man. <laughs> they <don't> say, <laughs> it's just like they roll out that line all the time, and it was like, mate, we were fit as in, and we were absolutely flying at that time. But yeah, the usual, mate, it's always it's always rolled out. Well, uh, he, he was quite, I thought he was quite gorgeous, so like, he looked like he could have been on the front cover of Vogue, whereas <laughs> Jim Buffy looked like he, he shouted out the numbers at the Vogue bingo. Was, <laughs> Did he love himself, Benetti? Ah, they loved himself, eh? Totally proper loved himself. Slight black, wasn't they? Proper slight black, eh? They, they did love themselves. They proper rated themselves, but I didn't. I don't mind that, to be honest. You know, if they can back it up, which they did to an extent. You know, I'd, it was uh, interesting times, but yeah, they loved themselves. See how he he played as well, didn't he, the manager? And he was your position. Yeah. Would you put him in training? Nah, you know what I was fuming with? He took my number, eh? Because I was number eight. That was my favourite number. So he took my number, eh? So I was devastated. I told him this after. Not at the start, because we didn't have a good relationship at the start. But afterwards, I said, I can't believe you took my number. Uh, he says, oh, that's what I always used to play. And I used to play in the top leagues in Italy. And I was like, ah, fair enough. You know, fair enough. <laughs> but I was fuming, eh? He took my number. So, um, but yeah, now he's... Sorry, sorry, man. You... No, no, I was just saying, it was just... Uh, yeah, just different cultures, mate, when they come on. Totally, totally changed there. Eh? So how come you didn't get on with the start? No idea, mate. It was very strange. Like, I played... I'd, so, I'd, when Jockey, when we got back up to the Premier League, so I played I was played about 20, 30 games the first season. I played every single game the second season, apart from one. I missed one game up at Aberdeen. Um, and then they came in. And then, no idea who I was. Like, absolutely no idea. Like, so I was basically... Turned up for pre-season training. Um, they were basically calling me by my number, number 12. So I was number 12. No idea who I was. I was like, 
man, like if you've done any research, I've played the last two seasons, all season. <laughs> and I was like, we went to Italy and um, we done a, it was in the first few, the first week we'd been in Italy. So we were in Italy for three weeks, was fucking torture as, as, as horrendous, um, up in a mountain, just stuck there secluded, training for three weeks, it was minging. But the first week we were there, we'd done like a, a practice match and it was the, like the first team, the new first team, against like the jobbies, the reserves. I wasn't even on either team. I was in, I was in the stand, mate. And I was like, I just played all, all season, the season before. I was like, something wrong here, man. I was like, fuck this, man. It's human. <laughs> That's brilliant. <laughs> Can I get a game for the jobbies? Uh, mate, I couldn't believe it. Would you go and pull them, Doug? Would you say like, what's happening yet? Not at that time because it was a brand new regime, man. You know, like what well, it's it's a clean slate for everyone. So you know, when managers come in, they always I will give everyone a chance. Just sort of fair enough. You sort of have to fight your way back in. But even the first first few games of the season, I wasn't even on the bench. Yeah. I was in the stand watching the game, so I was like devastated. And then luckily got my chance. Um, Patricio Billio got sent off at St Mirren, and I was I think I was the only midfielder on the bench, so I think he would have been looking around like. Oh. <laughs> Who else can play midfield? And luckily, I can play midfield, so he's like, right, "You go, you go." And I done well, done well number enough 12, in that game. Number twelve, go and get Lord Number up. twelve, you go. No idea what your name is, but you can go on. Have a have a run, mate. <laughs> so um, I got on and done done okay. And then Patricio Billio was suspended for two games. I think it was a naughty challenge he got sent off for. And then I started the next game, and then from there, mate, it was like he went for having no time for me. To, Absolutely love him. It was mental. The change around was unbelievable, mate. It was crazy. What about, uh, see, obviously the Italians are massive on the diet and stuff like that. Did he try and change the boys' diets? Um, not, not so much. Well, they had some, because we had like Caballero, like Caballero had obviously came to the club who had the worst diet ever. The unfittest guy ever. But what a player, mate. Like, what a player. Um, so I think he, he couldn't really say much, too much to us lot because some of the boys he brought in weren't the greatest in terms of their uh, culture and their sort of mentality and professionalism. So we were all right. It was the first day of pre-season. They came in like, it was total culture shock. In the canteen at lunchtime, they're on the beers and that, mate. First day, on the, on the, on the fags and that. And we're like, what's going on here, man? It's just totally different. Just mental, like totally different to what we're used to. Um, I that, man. Oh, mate, it was crazy, crazy times, but... What, the manager would spark a beer? Uh, the assistant, Dario. So, you know, they had the co-manager, so it was Ivano and his brother, Dario. So Dario used to take all the training. Uh, he'd come in uh, the canteen, like, at, half, at lunchtime. Before another session, he'd be on the beers and that, mate. We're like, we're like, what's going on here? Just totally different, mate. It was mental. It was good. It was good fun. <laughs> oh, brilliant. Uh, you obviously mentioned Caballero there. They brought in some tremendous players, Caballero and Imsadze, Juan Sara. So did they boys come in and get on with you straight away or did it take a while for you to, to kind of bond? Um, a little bit to bond, I think, but for the, for the majority of them, the boys were great. Like They were really good guys that just love just loved football. And I think they absolutely they loved their time in Scotland. They loved their time at Dundee and how the, the whole scenario of playing for Dundee was. I think it was a lot more... Um, relaxed and maybe some of the stuff they've been used to. So um, yeah, the boys, the boys that came in were great, and by the time they left, they were like proper Scotsmen, mate. They loved it every, every weekend and just loving it. See, when you said about Caballero's diet and like his attitude, like what sort of stuff? What would he eat, and would he just walk about in training? I can't mate. I, like if you ever, if you've ever played Argentinian players or South American players, training during the week, not interested. Like no interest. Come the weekend, come the Saturday, they just switch it, flick it on mate it's unbelievable how they can do it like I could never ever do that you know like most players have got to really train intensely and then the weekend they're alright they boys had no time for training but come the weekend it was just like flick a switch and they were amazing but Caballero was like I remember like he had a rental car and somebody one of the guys we, we knew what the guy that had the garage that was giving them the rental car and something happened it broke down there actually he went to, he went to pick it up um, to like fix it for him and the whole, I remember the boys saying the whole back seat was covered in M&M's. Just M&M packets and M&M's. You know? <laughs> it's just meant to be our star striker, mate. Just nay, nay, um, he just nay professional was at all. But he was, um, and even like doing, we came back one pre-season with Caballero. We'd done the bleep test 
and we had the heart rate monitors on, right? I think he got to level 8.5, right? 8.5. But it was full of, like, his heart rate monitor was, it was gone. It was through the roof. That was him, mate. It wasn't like, he wasn't pulling out just for the sake of it, for the batter. He was gone. That was him. Fly out. It was amazing, mate. But what a player, man. Wow. Oh, I his face as well. He looked like he smoked about a hundred a day, man. He smoked. <laughs> what a player, mate. Honestly, was incredible. He frightening, uh... frightening, mate. See, for a midfielder, like this link-up play, like the weight of his pass coming back into you is when you make your run. It was every time he passed, it was perfect. Every single time, it was amazing. Was he the best at all? Them Caballero and them Sadze, Juan Sara, because them Sadze was some player as well, wasn't it? Them Sadze was quality, mate. I mean, obviously, I played in the middle with Georgia. I know his running and. He'd done like a step over and he'd get a man of the match every week. It was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> nah, he, he was quality, mate. He, was, uh, he scored goals in training and you'd just be like, oh, fuck, wow, what a player, man. But, but nah, Caballero was, was probably, the, I think Caballero was probably the best, apart from obviously when Claudio came in. Would they, would they boys take you, would you take them out in the team? Uh, they'd, mate, they'd, they'd come to Fatties and Marty's all the time, mate. All the time, loved it. Absolutely I bet, loved I bet it. they got a few birds, man, didn't they? Oh, mate, they'd be out every night. Like, we'd, every time we'd come out. And that's what was good about them. They really, like, sort of integrated well. Not so much like uh, Juan Sara was like, a bit, a lot more quiet, didn't drink. Um, some of the Italian boys didn't drink so much and didn't really come out. But they all tried to make an effort. But the likes of Georgie, uh, Caballero, Car- Beto Carranza, they all loved it, mate. They were out all the time. Oh, heroes. Absolute heroes. Right, mate, can you jack? When, when did you first see his link? Was, was it in the Dundee Tally? Aye, there was, like, again, loads of rumours. Loads of rumours about him coming in. And we were just like, ah, come on. Because we'd been linked with so many like players. And Crouch, Peter Crouch was getting linked. There was, it was just like was so many ridiculous rumours. And we were like, nah, not having it. Um, and then like, he turned up to training, mate. And then you, he came in like, with the training gear on, the full Dundee training gear. I was like, ah. This is, a, this is a wind up, like proper wind up. Um, what, well, first day he walked, he never had any of his clothes on, he just had the Dundee training kit. No, but the first time we seen him, he had his training kit on because he'd obviously been like taken to the stadium. We right. were at the training ground, and then so he, he just got like launched onto the training ground with his training gear on. And we were just like, ah, oh, fuck, this is incredible, mate. Incredible. What was he like his first day? Was he, was he sound or? A, a lovely guy, be- like really nice guy, very humble, chilled. Again, South American, very relaxed in training, done what he wants sort of thing, but he could sort of obviously accept it. Um, he used to always take his kids. His kids used to come down to training with him. He'd, be, he'd just be like, he'd be joining some things and then he'd toss off other stuff. He always had the hat on and, you know, the long hair and it was just like, mate, he was, he was incredible. What would these kids do? Just stand at the side and watch? Or, would, would or, like, or else he would just go and like, have a kick about with his kids. Like, well, we're training. Like, he'd be kicking about with his kids and that. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. See how, like, I've, I've spoke to a few people uh, last couple of days and they say that you're quite an angry guy when you're playing. Like, <laughs> did I don't annoy you that they would just, did it never annoy you that they would just go through the motions? Did you ever have a go at them? Oh, mate, I used to annoy the life of me, but it's hard because if the manager and that's accepting it and they sort of let, they're okay with that, then it's hard for me as a player. Don't get me wrong, it used to piss me off because, like, all of us, our boys, it was this, the, the spine of the team was still UK based, Scottish boys, and we, as a nation, will always work hard. That's what we do, that's what we're known for. So, to see them, like, not tossing off, but just taking it easy sometimes, I did used to get pissed off sometimes, but just had to accept it because, unfortunately, the, the people above us were okay with it, and that was it. Uh, Stephen Thompson told us about Kanija that he liked a fag before the game. Would he do the same at Dundee? Would he have a fag before he went out? Exactly the same thing, mate. So he'd be in, um, he'd come in for the warm up, and you know, in the home dressing room at Dens, that that dingy wee toilet in the side. And so he'd be in there, and the Benettis would be doing their team talk, and you just hear him like inhaling this fag, like <laughs> he's just, like so like powerful in inhalation of this fag, <laughs> this fag, mate. You're like. What? <laughs> and then he would go and then just be amazing, mate. He was he was incredible. Is he the best player you've played with? He's the best player I've played with, mate. Like, honestly, I've been very lucky to play with some outstanding players, but I still think he's the best player I've played with. He was like honestly like five levels above like what where he was. And he was thirty three when he joined, so I could only imagine him when he was in his prime. He must have been ridiculous. Would he ever get frustrated though, boys, obviously not being on his wavelength? 
No, he was all right. He was very chilled, mate. He was very relaxed, eh? Like, he was... I think he was just enjoying being back playing football because he'd been out for a while. Remember, he'd been out... He'd been out banned for... Like, he'd been banned for drugs or... Like, I can't remember what, like, testing, drug testing he got done. And he was out for a while. So, I think he was just buzzing to be playing football and enjoying it. And I, had, I ended up, like, get, having a really good relationship with him on the pitch. Like, we, we, we got on very, very well on the pitch. So, I loved him. He's my, my hero, only I loved him. Do you still speak to him now? No, no, don't speak to him, not so much. Now, one of the boys that I keep in touch with um, still speaks to him now and again. And um, yeah, no, I, not, not me personally, but you know, he's, uh, he's still, as I say, one of my heroes, mate. What a guy. Uh, see, what all the players come in, the calibre, it was unbelievable, obviously. Like, was, there a, was there a target set by the club? Like, what was the ambition? Was it to challenge Celtic and Rangers? It was definitely to be right up there, mate, for sure. It was um, definitely to, to push as much as we could. And whether it was to sort of, break obviously into that top top four top five clubs not so sure I think it was more about the model of getting these players like the, all the players they brought in and then you know building them up and then selling them but the transfer market like fell on its arse so the whole thing was was struggling you know from it was pretty much a couple of months after it started um the transfer market was dead so it was like then we knew there was going to be a problem further down the line mm. But we had obviously targets to ourselves to really push on, and and we done we done okay. We weren't probably weren't consistent enough, but when we were on, it was like some of the best football I've played. I've been involved in, and you know I've enjoyed that period playing on the side. I didn't particularly enjoy the training. It was like very tactical and a lot of fitness based stuff, and not so much ball work, and not really a laugh, you know, as much as what you used to. Um, but the games on the Saturday were amazing. I loved it. Any surreal moments under Benetti? Like. Obviously, with Italian, you see some of the things that they say in that, you pure piss yourself up and like, did you ever experience anything like that? No, I can't really remember like stuff they were saying, like, but we used to, <laughs> mate, it was a mad time. We used to stay at the Carnoustie Hotel before home games. Like, home games. It's further away but from your house than your house. Further away from the stadium than my house <laughs> in a beautiful hotel, costing the club a fortune. No wonder, mate, no wonder it was going to end up tits up because it was like, what is, like, every home game. Every single home game. So every away game, we're in a hotel, every home game. And we're like, mate, come on. And it was a beautiful hotel, so I don't know how much it was costing them, but it was, uh, it was crazy. But you know what I loved about them, mate? They didn't care who we were playing. They were just like, yeah, like we go to Ibrox, we go to Parkade. And they're like, well, who cares about them? Like, we'll play how we play. I loved it. It was just like... I love that, mate. That's what it's, that's them, what it's, yeah. Amazing, mate. They just they couldn't care. I mean, it wasn't like disrespectful to their team but it was just like so much confidence in our in our own team and their beliefs and it was it was great I loved it, it was, as I say it was enjoyable because you went to sell, you beat both Celtic and Rangers away from home like is that is it was that just down to that confidence in the team uh-huh? I am plus having good players playing well at that time you know we had a really good squad um, and like I said yeah they didn't we didn't go defensive we never went defensive anywhere where, where we went away from home it was always now we're just going to attack and we'll play how we play and that's it, which is really enjoyable to play. Uh, top six the first year, but the second year uh, finished ninth. Why was that? Uh, just that inconsistency, mate. Um, we also lost Caballero as well with a bad injury. He was out for a while. Um, so, yeah, losing him. And then Kanija wouldn't have been there the second year as well. I think he'd have been the Rangers at that point. So there were some big players missing. Um, and we obviously... Try to replace him, but probably couldn't do do as well as what we could in that first year. And um, yeah, that was disappointing. You're asking for trouble when you're replacing Claudio Canigia with Stephen Milne, aren't you? <laughs> we have all done all right, by the way. <laughs> the wee man done all right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, could you t- could you tell that Benetti was going to get a sack over here? I think there'd been loads of rumours and loads of stuff going on, and I think the, the relationship was starting to break down between the the club and the board and, and the uh, the coaching staff because they're very like they were very set in their ways I, I loved it about them the fact that they were very set in their ways but sometimes you've got to be able to sort of compromise a little and they just didn't they just didn't they just it was their way of the highway like yeah we're staying at a hotel get it paid for this is the three matches we're doing it every day this is what we want for lunch do it or you know we're no be happy sort of thing so there was a bit of and I think the expense of that was, was starting to become a big issue. Um, so there was definitely like rumours, but 
I didn't, no, we knew it was coming, but we didn't know when it was going to come. Were they, were they let you have like a glass of wine that night before the game, or the Italians? Um, they, mate, they were very chilled out about most stuff. You know, like, you always get the diet stuff, like, oh, they cut out some stuff, like, the baked, baked beans and all that. I hate folk do that. Baked beans and, like, butter and all that. Mate, come on, seriously, get a grip. Um, all that stuff. But no, apart from that, like, the glass of wine, no worries, mate. We were in pre-season up in Italian mountains, and, yeah, the boys were on the glass of uh, having a wine at, like, between sessions now. It's just, like... Totally foreign us, but yeah, they could, you could do what you want. Sorry, the last player I wanted to ask you about this time as well was Kits Bayer played there, man. Like, was he yeah. a screwball? You know what? We used to call him the volcano because, uh, like, sometimes he would just erupt. He was like the, like, training that, like, fine, but then someone, just someone, like, so innocuous would just set him off and then he would just go off his head, like, nuts. It was like. Did he fight boys? Did he fight boys? Yeah. Did he fight boys? No, nah, not fighting, but just like. Proper anger and just smashing boys and that, just getting stuck into them. Just like, mate, calm down. What a player as well, though. He was great. He was a, he was a good player. But, yeah, mate, he was just like, he had this fuse, very short fuse, and he would just go mental. And then his brother comes back to the club, Jim Duffy. Were you surprised <laughs> that it wasn't a, a manager for the continent that, that took over Fabinetti with all the names that they had there? Uh, not really, because it was sort of like that experiment had been the done the experiment and it's kind of had limited success but then it sort of failed towards the end so I wasn't that surprised um, and I was delighted obviously Duff was coming back because I've, I've obviously had a good relationship with him um, from youth team level and you gave him a chance at first team so I was delighted when he came back it was great Did you get your number 8 back as well? I did eh? straight away <laughs> to, be, to be fair to Benetti Benetti gave me the second year I think, I think he gave me the second year eh? Oh, did he stop playing the second year, though? Because he was in and out. Like, he was, the first year he was in and out, and I think the second year he, he just didn't want to play as much because he, he knew he couldn't do the both. So he, I'm sure he gave, he gave me my number back. But that's what I'm saying. He loved me that second year. It was mental. Right. Um, and then he took, like, a, a higher number, but he never really played at all that second year. See, with Duffy, top six and reached the Scottish Cup final... But how did they boys take the Jim Duffy, the foreign boys? Did they like his style compared to that laid-back Benetti style? I think they loved it. I think they loved his style. I think Duff done really well in marrying the two cultures together uh, with the players we had and making a, a really good, enjoyable environment for, us to, to, for both of us to work in that we both enjoyed. And it was great. It was brilliant, brilliant times. See the times when they were spending big money was was there good bonuses like we we get were you getting a win bonus you were thinking how the fuck are we getting that? Uh, nah, well, um, we did get win bonuses. It wasn't like it wasn't like extravagant, but some of the I can remember like some of the rumors of what some of the boys were on like the, the wages and that it was mental. We're just like how not that, that, that's impossible, <laughs> Men, mental. But have you, you know, still, never. You still on bad money at this time, Gov? I was on no, I was on okay money at this point because I'd been playing first team for about five years maybe at this point so I had kept getting like contract renewals because I was doing alright and by this time I'd, made, I'd been playing with Scotland at this point so um, I had alright money but seemingly some of the, the money that some of them were on was extortionate well, What were we talking like 10 grand a week? I, well, the rumours I mean I don't know for, for certain but that was the rumours up around about that yeah Wow to live in the Hilton on 10 grand a week <laughs> <laughs> uh, right mate, the Scottish Cup final. Did you feel confident going into that game? Aye, yeah, we were confident, mate. It was um we'd had a good run at it. We had we a good team. Um we were looking forward to it for sure and felt we had a chance for sure, yeah, going into it. We spoke to Rangers players, quite a lot of Rangers players that played in that final. They Any? said they said they were steaming for like four days. Did, did you use, uh, did you hear any rumours of that now? No. No, and it absolutely, it's like a dagger in the heart every time I hear that stories, man. Because uh, I hear the boys obviously speaking about it, and I was thinking, no way, man. Here's us gearing up for the biggest game of our lives, and they're out in the lash, and they still win. So, yeah, it was, um, I was, I'm spewing, like, listening back to that stories, and couldn't sense it, didn't know about it during the week. I knew they were going for the treble. Mm. So, obviously, we were just thinking, oh, they'll be, like, proper focused on that. Obviously, they weren't, but um, they still managed to go over the line, so it's definitely frustrating looking back at it. Because we could have easily won the game. Uh, you battered them the first half, especially, didn't you? We could have easily, ba- easily won the game, mate. We'd done really well first half. It was a boiling hot day. Um, 
and we played well enough to win the game, but just couldn't go over the line, couldn't get a goal, and then like we hit the post early doors. Barry Smith hit the post early doors, and then obviously Amaruso got the got the um, header from a corner. Would that be the most frustrating thing for your time at Dundee? Obviously, you won the championship, but that wee chance of winning a Scottish Cup, does that still kind of eat away at you? Oh, definitely. I, just, I mean, any time you get to a Cup final, you're going to win. It's, it's, uh, you look back and it, it's frustrating, but obviously that and the administration as well, just like, that was terrible times, mate. See, just on Barry Smith, did you ever see him put a bit of product in his hair? <laughs> <laughs> nah, he had the fuzzy, the fuzzy dome for years, mate. He loved it. <laughs> what was he like, Barry Smith? You know, meant to be a, a madman on the drinks. Ah, uh, Baz loved Baz loved it, baby. Yeah, Baz, <clears throat> Baz had this thing. He used to like always go. It doesn't do it now, but whenever he, whenever we went out on a Saturday, he'd be first. He'd be out straight away on the Sunday, but he would always like straight out like twelve o'clock. But he'd be in his bed by five in the on the Sunday, ready to go to training on the Monday because he'd had a massive sleep overnight. <laughs> Baz is legend, mate. Is he a massive Dun- is he a Dun- he was, he was a- is he a Celtic fan or a Dundee fan? Well, he's played for Celtic when he was younger and that, and then he came to Dundee. But you know, he was at Dundee for years, mate. So he's a I mean, we played together in the team together. So I came through with Baz. So I've got a lot of time for him. Brilliant, uh, right, mate? Next season, things get out of control. More expensive signings: Ravenelli, Craig Burley. Was there a point that you thought like this is this is going tits up? This is not going to end well. Uh, it was strange because, you know, we were still bringing in these sort of players after the sort of experiment from before. So we were like, what are what, like, what, what they doing? What, why are they still doing that? But I think it was like they were just going shit or bust, mate. Just going to try and get the best players in the, like they could and then hopefully do well and hope for the best. But yeah, it was crazy to still see players like that coming in. Obviously, Ravinelli was, with his background was, was huge and, and Butler obviously played for Scotland and had a great career as well. So... It was um, it was interesting, very interesting to still see that signings coming in, mate. Were you uh, were you close enough? Ever close enough to like the owners or the chairman to say like what's going on here? Nah, nah, nah. I never had that relationship at all with any of them because it, it changed quite a few times. Um, and at that point, I was just concentrating on my career, mate, as a player because you know, as a I always had to just try and concentrate as much as I could on my own career and make sure I was good enough to be playing every week, mate. To be honest. See, when that happened to me, was your thoughts like, I need to get out of here, I need to try and get myself a move, because this is going to go? Um, I was at that point in my career when I, I needed to move anyway, I felt. You know, I was, I'd been playing in, at the top level with Dundee for a good few years. Um, I'd been about, I'd been about 24, maybe 25 at that point. So I was ready, mate, I was ready for a move. So it sort of, it was good timing for me um, and good timing for the club when the, when the move came about, but horrible circumstances. Just on Ravenelli, mate. How, how was he? What was he like as a guy? He was a good guy. Lovely guy. Um, really good with the young boys. Like, try to make sure they were doing the things right and coaching points with the young boys. He was great. <laughs> it was funny, mate. I remember him, the administration, mate, went in administration and he came in, like, he's saying to the boys, he's saying to the club and that, he's like saying, oh, listen, I feel really bad for the players. You know, it's all right for me. I've made money. I'll smoke a cigar. I'm fine. But for the young boys, it's rubbish. <laughs> he was raging like he was, he was sticking up for the young boys, but it was brilliant. <laughs> brilliant. He was just like, I'll be smoking cigars. I was like, fair play, mate. But he was, uh, no, he, was, he was really good. Lovely, good character. What about Burley? Because he comes across as quite a controversial character, quite outspoken. Was he like that as well? But, so I knew Burley. I knew Craig from playing with Scotland. But my first experience with Butler's his nickname, wasn't very good. So I'd been called up for Scotland when I was 23, when I was playing for Dundee. Um, and then so got into training like proper, like, you know, apprehensive going into training, 23, playing with Scotland and got to training. And then so got through my first training session, like felt I'd done okay, so I was buzzing. And then picks up the paper the next day and um, basically Butler was saying, oh, it's, it's all right having these young boys in and around the squad, but they've got to be good enough. I was like, fuck you. Hell, man. Absolutely killed us. So whether he was misquoted or whatever, I, I, was, I was just thinking, you prick, man. I'm just, I'm trying, my, trying like a bear here to be up to standard and you've absolutely killed me. Um, he was always an outspoken character, but yeah, he was all right when he came back to Dundee. He was fine. Didn't play that much because obviously he wasn't there that long before he went into administration. Is that true, though, that he lost his teeth chasing his first touch? <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> no comment. Right, uh, De Stefano, mate, comes on the board. His clients, Harold Shipman, Saddam Hussein. I mean, did you ever meet him? Did you have any experiences with him? I used to used to come to games like and I'd met him, but you know, he was it wasn't really much to do with like the playing side, but yeah, some of the some of the stories and, and what he'd done and what he'd been through and that was just like it was like a con man, eh? You just thought this guy's at it. There's, there's something wrong here. There's something there's something up here. Um I think everyone thought that, but it's uh yeah, it was again another really strange time in, in, in Dundee's sort of history. Right, mate, Dundee two thousand and three administration, twenty five people losing their job. Uh, what can you remember for the, the days? That was horrible, mate. I'd, I'd one of the worst days in, my, in football. Um, I played for Scotland, got pumped six one in the Holland game in the European playoff, chasing Davids about for ninety minutes and couldn't get near him. And then came off the pitch and got told the club was in administration and we had to fly back for a meeting the next morning. So it was horrible, mate. I, you know, there was boys there, there was staff that had been at the club for like. Like the whole time I was there, eight, nine years, Big Jamie came through YTS and me, been there for about seven, eight years. Duffy just read out their names. All these boys were gone. If your name's read out, you're gone, basically. And you had to just pack your bag, black bags. Boys are going to the boot room, getting the black bags, gone. That was it. Contract ripped up. They were going to get like a tiny, tiny percentage of the contract. It was horrible, man. Horrible times. Was there tears? Was there, was there people in oh. tears? There was the the players were not players were all right. I think they were a bit in shock and disbelief at what had happened. Um, but some of the, like the staff who were like having to deal with, it and like the the board members having to tell the players were were devastating. They were like in tears. One of the guys couldn't do it, and that's why Duffy ended up having to. He took the list off him, and he, Duff had to do it. So Duff had to tell all the boys like they were gone. It was minging me. Oh my god, man! I've never seen anything. Like, I've never had anything like that. I could only horrible, imagine. mate. Wow. Uh, so you played your last game at Celtic Park. Did you know that would be your last game for Dundee? No, nah, I thought I thought, it might, I thought there might be a chance because it was coming closer to the, the transfer window. And there have been loads of rumours, you know, about... I mean, one of the reasons I got kept on was because at that, <clears throat> at that point, I was viewed as an asset for the club. Um, small asset, but an asset at that point, which, which <laughs> is all right. Um, so, yeah, no, nah, there have been rumours, but I didn't realise that it was going to be my last game. I'd had this... Niggling hamstring injury. It was annoying. So uh, I, maybe a few weeks before I left, that was my last game. But I didn't know it was going to be my last game at that point. No. So when did you first hear for Rangers? Oh, there'd been I'd been sort of linked with Rangers a, a few a few times. Like so, I'd actually been linked with Rangers when Advocat was the manager because um, I was playing really well. But then I think they failed to get to the Champions League. But if they got to the Champions League, they were going to put an offer in through my agent. He was telling me because. You know, you'd have like the squad for like the Champions League, and then you you still got the SPL, so to have a bigger squad. So they ended up getting beat. So that never came about. So I was devastated at that point. And then um, McLeish had been in touch with my, with my agent again, and it moved quite quickly after that. I think their hand got forced because of um, I think there was a couple of injuries to their midfielders at that point. So I had a chance to go straight into the team. Two hundred and fifty grand bid accepted. You feel like it should have been a bit more. No, nah, I was I'm more than happy with that, mate, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, Murray, you're talking, isn't it, young man? <laughs> mate, it was, uh, I had this thing in my contract, you know, you get like a percentage of the deal and that. And the Duff, the Duff gave it the pure violin strings. Oh, we're going to, what about if you leave it for the, the club and the, and the youth team? We could put it towards the academy, the youth team. You came through the youth team. And I was like, ah, all right, Duff, no worries. So I just left it. And it was a good point. Yeah, it was like, he was making a, a pretty valid point. And I was like, it worked for everyone. I got my move. The, cl- uh, the club got a bit of money. Um, so everyone was sort of happy. It was perfect. So what, you gave a bit of your money to the, the club? I could have taken more of this. I could, I'd have had a signing on fee if I didn't waive it to go back to the club, basically. Yeah. Oh, what a man. That must have felt good, no? No, the t- not at the time. That was minging. <laughs> but <laughs> but it, was the right, it was the right thing to do. It was the right thing to do, of course. Brilliant for you. Uh, what was it like the day you signed for Rangers, mate? Can you remember the drive through the first time you speak to Alan McLeish? Talk us through the full day. So I'd been up in, I was up in Aberdeen visiting my family, and then McLeish phoned us and he says, "Listen, we're gonna, we're gonna get this deal done." He says, "No, we're delighted to get you on board." And I was like, oh, "Brilliant, thanks very much. Can I wait to get started?" Went down, done my medical, and um, obviously a bit apprehensive, a bit of nerves. And as I say, I'd had this sort of niggling hamstring injury, so I'd done all the the medical, done the, loads of MRIs perfect medical fine 
But I had to go to the ground and do, I had to go to the training ground and do a fitness test. So, gets to the training ground and it was a fitness test with the physio and two players that were coming back from injury as well. And we had to do like this, it was, just, it was a skills session, mate. Like, listen to this. Mikey Moles and Ronald De Boer and me. And I'm like, oh, wow. This is going to be a test. They're just going to be thinking, who is this guy? Seriously. Mate, I've never done, I've never done skills in my life. I've never even done, I've done, I think I've done one Cruyff done in my whole career. So I was just like, oh, no, this is going to be tough. Um, but managed to get through it. It's probably the most skillful I've ever been for an hour and a half of my career, mate. It was amazing. But it's just pure proper concentration. Um, so, yeah, got, got through the medical I got the deal signed and yeah, it was buzzing, mate. It was buzzing to get in and, and train with the squad the next day. Mate, they've stitched you up with that, by the way. There's no way. Who does a skills test in their medical? Mate, I was like, ah, it was like a fitness test, but the, it, it turned into like the fitness test had skills in it. And the running part, I was buzzing. I was like, I know, what is it? As soon as it came to the skills, I was like, oh, no, here we go. <laughs> was Moles and Deboer, were they a joke, even though they were still just mate, coming back? They were it? unbelievable. Unbelievable, mate. Skills for fun, as oh no, I'm gonna to have to really like try and produce someone here. <laughs> oh, amazing. Uh, what was Alex McLeish like? Good guy, good eye, yeah, no, good. Really, you know, I, I grew up in Aberdeen and he was, you know, played for the team I supported when I was growing up, so he's a hero of mine anyway. Yeah, so it was kind of surreal that he was now uh, gonna be the gaffer. So, um, but yeah, no, big, larger life character, good coach. Uh, yeah, I, I was buzzing to get the deal done, mate. Because Ferguson left the previous summer, didn't he? Uh, was that kind of your challenge going to take his spot? Aye, and they'd signed a few players as well, and I think they had a few injuries as well. So ne- Christian Nellinger was there. Officer Teta was there. Um, they had Emerson. Do you remember Emerson? He uh, played for Burnham. Was, what a player, that. Mate, he was fuming when I turned up for training, mate. Fuming. <laughs> I can still feel his stare at me just now, mate. He's just like, oh, wow. Because <laughs> he's obviously known that I've came as a centre midfielder. Um, he probably he didn't know who I was but somebody must have told him oh he's a centre midfielder and he'd have probably just thinking oh fuck's sake so he was fuming like so we'd done shape the, the day before the, the old firm game and I was playing and he was at the team so he was tossing everything off mate he was fuming absolutely fuming I was like oh, fuck's sake. Wait, the guy was like 35 at the time man who cares I know but obviously he still thought he was amazing he was still good obviously but you know he was he was just thinking who's this wee dick coming to take my, my position sort of thing. so it was uh yeah, it was a bit, a bit nerve wracking, but good to, just good to get in and get training with the team and, and get sort of used to um, the new squad because it's the first time I'd moved in my career. I'd never moved, so it was, yeah. it was brand new to me as well. Did he actually ever say anything to him or something? Or was it just a death stare? I was just a death stare, and, and you could tell he was pissed off and he was just tossing everyone off. But he, he left pretty soon after because you know I think he'd he'd been up to I think the manager had enough of him anyway. So um, yeah, he wasn't there for long. Who's to do? Straight away, who's to do ability wise? Who, who are you thinking? Wow, what a player! Uh, Arteta was phenomenal, you know, obviously similar, well, same position as me. And you play against him in training and just try, you couldn't get a ball off him, mate. He was like such a so, low center of gravity, twisting and turning, just couldn't get near him. Eh? He was like, he was like proper arrogant, though. I didn't like Arteta at that point. I think he's, he's chilled out a bit now, but he was like proper arrogant at that time. And whether it's just the way his character was, I was just thinking, mate. You're a dick, you know, just like a bit more welcoming, mate. You know, uh-huh. he was just very, very up himself. I felt at that time, but um, obviously, is it like that at a big club though, Gov? Is there a few players that are like that? Is it a lot less welcoming than, say, a Dundee? Uh, it can be, I think, and I think that because you go up that level, you know, you go up the all these all these players, and every single one's an international player. Yeah. You know, so everyone's they've got to have that. You've got to have that uh, belief in yourself. It's something I probably lacked in my career. I see some players that, you know, have got so much self-belief in themselves. They're the ones that will make the top grade because they, they believe in themselves so much. Um, and I think a lot of the, obviously, coming into a dressing room like Rangers, I mean, as I say, everyone was internationals. All very good players, very good, tough mentality, good character. So it can be daunting when you go in as a, as a player coming from them day, of course. I know Barry Ferguson wasn't there, but was there ever any, any players at the start, like when you make a mistake in training, they'd probably get on you? Uh, Stephen Thompson told the story about Ronald De Boer. I don't know if you've seen it, mate, but I absolutely yeah, I did. <laughs> I did, yeah, yeah. Now, to be fair, like, he was all right, mate. You know who um, Jan, Jan Wouters, you know the assistant. He, he, like, yeah. he said something to me in training, like, and I didn't agree with it. And so I, I'd said to him, like, well, nah. He stopped the full training, mate. I was like, oh, fuck, I wish I hadn't said nothing. Eh? 
So I was basically saying, like, you should, you should come into me and then go out. And he says, no, you, you, should, you, should just, you should just miss him out. And I was like, hey, okay, but you could still come to me and I could do it. And he said, nah, nah, I stopped the full training. And I was like, oh, fuck. So I was like, right. And then just sort of had to agree with him. And I was just like, right, you've got to know. I've got to sort of learn. I've got to know when to sort of pick my battles and who to pick them with. Um, Fernando was demanding, very demanding. Um, and Fernando and I used to kick lumps at each other in training. Like, we had a relationship where we could kick shit out of each other in training, but both accept it. Like, he could smash me and I'd, I'd take it, and I could smash him and he'd take it. Um, but again, another tough character. And yeah, there were some, some good players there for sure. What about who was good with you, like, uh, personality wise? Who, who kind of helped you settle in? Mikey Moles was brilliant with me, mate. Really good with me. I, I still speak to Mikey now. He was he was brilliant, you know. For someone like that to sort of probably know that it was it was a daunting time for me coming into a club like that and into that dressing room. Um, he was great. I mean, I knew some of the boys anyway. I knew obviously if, well, Fergie wasn't there at that point, but some of the boys from Scotland anyway. So I knew some of them. Um, but Mikey was great. I can remember I got stitched up in the paper um, not long after I went, mate. Absolutely devastated. So we had a. Uh, we had a game against Hearts, I think it was, on the Saturday. And uh, so I'd I done the press on the Friday. And if you play for the old firm and you get selected to do the press on the Friday, you're just like, oh, fuck. Because you just know, you know, something, you might get set up. Yeah. So it was just like, oh, all right, okay. At this point, I didn't know this. This is my first <laughs> first press conference. So one of the guys says, oh, it had been a bit of a tough time for, for Rangers at that point. We weren't doing particularly well. And one of the guys, the press guy, says, like, if someone was just bang, it was like an off the cuff comment. It was just like, do you think, like, foreign players coming to Rangers, coming to a club at Rangers, know how much it means to um, the club when maybe not getting results or things aren't going so well? And I, I just basically says, well, yeah, maybe because I've, like, grown up in Scotland, I've obviously seen Rangers and set like, and the expectations and that. Um, he totally changed it. So the headline was the next day foreigners don't have a clue what it means to play for Rangers. And bearing in mind, I'm in a dressing room with Stefan Kloss, Mikey Moles, Shot Avaladze. All these boys have won leagues and cups with Rangers. And I'm like, oh, um, you... it's my first first uh, con- press conference, mate. I was devastated. And we had hearts the next day. So I remember going through, with the, get the bus through the next day. And I remember somebody chucked me the paper. I was on the bus early. And I seen the paper and I was like, oh, oh fuck. Like, it was proper shit myself. And then Stefan, so Stefan Kloss was fuming, fuming, raging, mate, raging, like proper raging, like. What did and he then, say there? Did he say something there? You know, he, he said something, he, like, he basically held up a paper, he was like, ah, he's saying to all the boys, like, what the fuck's this? Like, oh, no, <laughs> proper, like, shrinking into the seat, right? So we play the game, uh, Craig Moore scores on a penalty, and they equalised in the last minute. So everyone's fuming in the dressing room. I was like, I was just praying we could get a win. Everyone's fuming in the dressing room. So Stefan brings it up again in the dressing room after the game. And I was like, oh, no. Nah. So it was Stefan, Steph Kloss, Mikey Moles and the gaffer. Everyone else had left and the gaffer's like, you, you all stay, stay here. And Mikey was amazing. Mikey stood up for me and says, Stefan, come on. You know what like the press can be. You know, he's obviously just, he didn't mean it like that. And Mikey Moles was amazing, mate. He properly like, protected me from a situation that could have been horrendous. It's kind of strange, though, because after that, like, Steph and I got on brilliant, but just that day, mate, it was horrible. Eh? Mate, that's the worst. Like you say, you're just praying the team wins, and you know it's oh, going to be brought mate. back up, man. It's the worst. Horrible, mate. Terrible. Uh, right, mate, just a bit, a bit about your debut. Like, you say you done shape there, and you were in the team. Did you expect to play against Celtic at Celtic Park? Well, the, the gaffer had said... You know, if we can get the deal done on time, then you'll play. Um, and that's why I was like doing all the tests, doing all the MRIs, and also um, I trained with the team twice, full two full training sessions. So if I got through them, then I was going to be able to play. Obviously, um, so I was looking forward to it. You know, I'd signed. I'd only signed two days before, and then obviously the first game I think it was the third of January. Yeah. How was the dressing? How was the dressing room before I set the Rangers game? What's it like? I intense. You know, there's, there's tension, and you know, proper people getting up for it. I was, at that stage in my career, mate, I was confident in myself. You know, I was ready. I was ready for it. I was ready to do it. I was ready to get the boots on, get the strip on and get out there and, and go play and go and try and prove myself. But, um, yeah, and I was, uh, I'd never been to an old firm game. You know, I, I, you, we used to always go out and Dundee and watch your games on a Sunday, Super Sunday. We'd go and watch all the old firm games, all the boys. It was amazing. But I'd actually never been to a game. So my first game was actually playing them one. It was mental. How was the noise in that when you walk out? 
crazy, mate. Absolutely crazy. Like you can't even, like for me to like five meters away, your teammate you can't even hear them because of the noise. There's you can't even there's no point in shouting. No point you can't even hear. Well, and then a nightmare, mate, you come off after thirty five minutes. And uh, right. you see when that happens, it's like panic set in straight away. I've just signed here, we've been beat three and a half sale, like, I'm now injured. Is that hard to get back to top form after that's happened to you? I you know you know what, mate, it's it set the whole the precedence for for yeah. the whole move. It set the whole three and a half years of the army, it was minging. Um it was just like, you know, it was hard enough coming into the team. I'd had this sort of injury, but it was, it was sort of away. But I remember making a burst and run into the box, past Lenny, got the ball, and then felt my hammy just go, and I was like, I can't believe I'm going to have to come off here. And obviously we ended up getting beat as well. It was just, it was minging it, absolutely minging. And just knew it was going to be a battle up and up against it all the way from there on in. How hard has it been at a team like Rangers when it's not going well? Like, see, day-to-day life when you're injured as well, and the atmosphere around the place, is it, is it horrible? Mate, it's disaster. You know what like, the clubs are, mate. If you lose one game or draw a game, it's a total disaster. It's like, it's unacceptable. So, you know, if, you're, if you've got that, plus I wasn't playing and I was out injured, it's just you're helpless to do anything. It's minging in. And, you know, obviously it's not a way you want to start a move. And um, it was a terrible start to my move. Can you see, like, can you see boys arguing in training? Is it constantly arguing? And is there, like, friction in the dressing room? Or were they players not really like that? It's more just like demanding, you know, more off each other and to try and make sure that the club wins because nobody wants to be in that situation when they're not winning at a club like Celtic or Rangers because it's, it's horrible, mate. It's just like proper intense pressure all the time. And, you know, everyone's trying to like make it better, but it's tough. It's tough when you're in that little rut and you can't get the wins. Mm-hmm. And then second season as well, mate, didn't they play uh, much the next season? Was that doing injuries as well? Aye, so I, I came back the... Um, from a hamstring injury, I'd missed seven seven games. I, I missed seven weeks. Made sure Mohammed was all right. Came back, got a run in the team. So I played eleven games in a row. Scored a couple of goals, and then done my cruise up at Tannadice against uh, United uh, for rain. Um, and kind of a three all draw. I think the game was. Um, and then from there, it was just nightmare after another. Mate, I'd ACL reconstruction. I'd never done injury in my life, like major injury, ACL reconstruction, and then coming back from that. Um, I had a problem with my right knee where I had to get my quadricep tendon shaved so I missed two years basically Nightmare man you get that big move and then that happens at Dundee and Rangers once how does that happen? Mate it's so strange like before Rangers and after Rangers I never really had any um, just at Rangers it was all all my injuries condensed in my career was at Rangers and minging because I was, went there to win to win trophies to enjoy it to enjoy playing at a club at Rangers at Ibrox every week week in week out Training at a, on a beautiful training field, I just never got a chance, you know. And plus, clubs like that you're sitting. In, I'm in the gym every day, you know, doing my work and trying to get back. There's new signings coming in, in my position. Like they must have signed about five midfielders in that time, so you're just like, it's going to be a tough road back. But you've just got to, just got to keep going, I suppose. One of the midfielders, Barry Ferguson, came back. Um, when you see him sign again, do you think like it's going to be impossible for me to get back in this team? Ah, it was always going to be tough. I mean, the players that they did sign uh, to come into that position were obviously very good players. Fergie coming back, um, he'd obviously been there and done it all with Rangers um, and obviously with Scotland. And Fergie and I are roughly the same age. I think he's six months younger than me or six months older. There's not much in it. So we'd played youth team level. So I know what level he was at. He was a fantastic player. So I knew it was going to be tough. Um, but I was just, to be honest, I was just thinking, I'll get back and I'll get playing with him. You know, I'll get... Whoever's playing in midfield, you know, I'll try and get in, try and get in involved, and just never really got a, got a good run at him. Any stories of Fergie on like how how demanding he is, like I'm being on on boy straight away. Ah, he's proper demanding. Like I can remember, um, we played a game at Ibrox, and it was funny. I was I wasn't even playing. I wasn't meant to be playing. So we're done shaping the Friday. This would have been Walter Smith's time, and I wasn't meant to be playing in in that in the game. And we'd done shape, and somebody got injured in the shape. So I ended up, the, the right midfield position came up, and what was that? I said, oh, you, you fancy playing there? I said, oh, fuck it, I'll play there, any worries, I'll play, play wherever. <laughs> Mate, I was absolutely terrible in the game, right? Minging. The first half, minging. I was kind of doing nothing right. I was thinking, right, it's not been that far from centre midfield. I was thinking it was going to be all right. I was minging. I was taking corners. Never took a corner in my life, you know. Just <laughs> everyone in the, the whole day was just minging. And um, I made a mistake in the first half, I think, in... Fergie's like, I could see him just like looking at me, just like, basically, what the fuck are you doing? 
And for him to do that in front of the crowd, I'm thinking, fuck's sake, Fergie, you're killing me here. I know I'm having a nightmare. But you doing that is me helping. It's not helping me one bit. Um, and, and eventually, it came in the second half, actually scored a dive in Hedy, so it all was forgotten. But yeah, tough. He's very demanding. But it's, it's his character, and that's why he's been a winner. Mate, centre midfielder playing right mid. I don't think it's the worst. It is the worst, man. I absolutely hate it. Um, the, 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 the team still won the league that year, though. Were you made to feel part of the celebrations, or was it... Could you enjoy, still enjoy it? You still played enough uh, games at medal, didn't you? No, I never, well, I never played one minute that the year we won the league. Never played, that was the year I missed out. So I never played one minute. So, um, that was when I was out with injury. With injury. So it's tough because you, you feel part of it. The way, the way Rangers training ground set up, so the gym's in the main part. So everyone's always in the gym. So I was always with the boys before and after training and out in the training field doing my running and stuff. You could feel part of it a little bit, but not in terms of the games. I was always there to try and push them on when you know it was a bad result or you know we done well and try and keep the encouragement. But you don't really feel part of it as much as you know, obviously as much as playing. What I do, what I did enjoy, and what I look back on fondly is the fact I got to witness the celebrations from inside, like you know in the dressing room after the game, on the bus back to Ibrox at Ibrox on the on the pitch with the league trophy and that. To be able to say I've enjoyed to be part of that was was amazing. Even though I didn't play part of the game. I still look at that fondly. Don't get me wrong, if I'd been able to be part of it, it'd have been 100 times better, but it was still good to see that. But it's, it's difficult to feel part of it when you're out for so long. Uh, third season, mate, Lazio missed again due to injury. Alex McLeish let go. New manager coming in. Did you think, like, new manager coming in, this is my chance now, fresh start, get fit and impress him? Yeah, so I'd finished that season. I played the last few games of that season um, and was doing well. I actually ended up playing for Scotland in the summer. Um, so... You know, it was, for me, it was perfect time and I was ready to go. I was actually got a decision finished because I was just getting in to hit my strides. But, you know, with Le Guin coming in, new manager, I thought, yeah, great, ideal. You know, a new, new clean start. Everyone's clean slate. So I was, I was buzzing, mate. I was looking forward to it. Mate, everyone was buzzing when Le Guin got the job, wasn't it? Because he was a big name at Leon, and uh, the players the same, huh? But, mate, it was a, everyone, it was, like, I think everyone's the same as the fans. It was a massive coup, you know, because he'd done so well at Leon. You know, there was teams, big, massive teams in the world courting him to try and get him. And then, you know, he, he went for Rangers. So we were buzzing, mate. It was a massive, massive um, appointment of that, we felt at that point. See, like, see, when he first came in and he said, like, about the fitness and how he was going to change everything, with the players receptive straight away? Because I know myself, when De Canio came to Swindon, mate, he gave a big speech the first day about how he was going to change everything. We walk in the dressing room and said, this guy's kidding himself, man, this will never happen. Was it, was it similar at Rangers? Exactly the same, mate. You know what it's like. You know, try to change culture so quickly is very difficult, mate. And um, he was very similar, mate. Same thing. Nay baked beans. You know, nay poached eggs or something. Something stupid. Like he was just like, what? Am I all right? Just like no, just not what we were used to. Um, and I can get why people try and do it and try and change the culture. But if you do it too quickly, then the boys are just thinking, mate, come on, just relax a bit, you know. Um, but yeah, no, he was he was very like down the line, straight down the line. Was, did he take you straight away? Go. I, had, I got on. I got on well with me. You know why? Most coaches will. I'm fine with because I'm a. I was always a good pro, like proper professional, dedicated to my craft. You know, really uh, enjoyed training, enjoyed the games, and never really a disruptive force. So I was. You know, I got on with most of my coaches, and I think he just enjoyed it. He liked the fact that I was proper professional and you know uh, try to look after himself as much as possible. So I, I had an issue with him at all. Eh? How was, how was the pre-season? Was it as tough as everyone makes it or was it quite easy for you? It was tough, mate. Um, I can remember, I think, watching Charlie's um, show with you. Charlie that year, mate, when he came back, mate, wow, he was on fire, mate. Like, I can remember he came back and obviously Charlie's a big unit. He was like five, ten lengths in front of everyone, mate. He was flying, mate. But it was a proper tough pre-season. But that's how he got his chance because he was doing so well. He was so far in front. Um, it, it was just, but as I say, different culture. Like even like stretching and training, you weren't allowed to talk to each other and stretching when you were stretching before training. You had to proper concentrate, and we we're like, "Come on, man, seriously." It was so stuff like that I, I don't particularly like, but um, it was. It was just a totally different preseason. Charlie was flying. Who was struggling? <laughs> Usuals. Bob, mate. Bob Malcolm was always up there. No, but or not up there, but behind. Uh, yeah, nah, Bob wasn't the, Bob wasn't the greatest at pre-season. Um, like, yeah, Bob, probably, yeah. Okay? 
You could ping a ball though, couldn't you? Oh, mate, technique, unbelievable, mate. Passing mm-hmm. ability, quality, mate. Yeah. Uh, how, how, how early did like the serious issues start to arise? Was it Fernando, Fernando Rickson incident on the plane? Aye, so that was that would have been the first major one. Obviously, that was pretty, you know, pretty early on in his his reign. So, you know, I think the the incident with Fernando. I think he tried to like set his stall out as if to say, like, you can't fuck with me, or else you're gone. No matter who you are. Mm-hmm. And Fernando, obviously, being one of our best players, mate, and he'd been playing a season like a couple of seasons before. So he set his stall out. This is what we're doing. I don't care who upset you. You basically you abide by my rules, or you're you're gone basically. And that was a that was a major major instant for the team. Man. What are you thinking when you're watching that? I couldn't believe it, mate. I actually couldn't believe it. I remember. Um, so what happened was obviously we were fighting South Africa in pre-season. And we're all just I can remember just like trying to doze off on the plane, and then Fernando was getting a bit boisterous. I think he'd had a couple of drinks, and then we landed, and then the next minute. Le Guin got the group together. He'd obviously pulled Fernando. Fernando got sent to a different hotel and next flight, next flight him, told the group, he like pulled the group together, says his behaviour or what he's done, it's not professional. He'll never play for this club again. And we're like, oh, the fuck? Mate, wow. Like, it was, because he was such a big player for us, we were like, oh, fucking hell. Like, all right. So I think, as I say, he was, I think he was just trying to set his stall out. He had to sort of, his way of the highway sort of thing. See, at that stage, God, would nobody stand up and say, like, nah, I disagree. I don't think he's done anything too bad. I don't think he could, mate, because he was still really early in his reign. So we didn't even know him. We didn't know, you know, how we would take that. And I think over time, even if we had done that, it would have been the wrong thing because that wasn't his, that wasn't his way, mate. Like, if you, if you opposed him, go on, mate. Finished. So do you have that aura about him that players were scared of him? Scared of him just because he wasn't, he was ruthless just to say, like, Fuck you, I don't care who you are, like, you'll be gone if you didn't do what I do. But you know, like, you're, you're expecting from a manager to get everyone together, so you're all sort of pulling in the right direction. That's more like, he's just saying this is the way it is and that's it, which isn't it. It's not particularly conducive to getting the best out of a, of a team uh, dynamic, but that was his, that was his way and he, he just dealt with it. As a guy who I know loves a tackle and loves working hard in training, like, we spoke to your other teammates, they were in bewilderment, sorry, when Phil Barsley was sent off for a tackle on Buffel and training. Were you the same? Were you thinking, like, what the fuck's going on here? I thought it was harsh. Like, what a challenge it was, man. It was, like, the best challenge ever. Like, it was hard but fair. Like, he timed it absolutely perfect. Buffel done about six somersaults, but it was, like, it was perfect timing. He, he absolutely nailed him. But within the laws of the game, like, it wasn't, like, there was no, like, studs up. It wasn't over the ball. He just nailed him. He, like, timed it perfect and nailed him. But I think it was such a hard challenge that Le Guin had a problem with it and just sent him off. And we were like, ah, right, all right, I can sort of see where you're coming from, but fuck, that's a bit harsh because Burge was a great player for us, mate. It was just like, yeah. he was a good, good player. So we were like, ah, fucking hell. That weakens us because at that point, we weren't winning every week. We were, you know, there was results that weren't great. So we were desperate to have the best players playing. So would he actually say to you, like, don't tackle each other in training? Not, not openly, but... You, I think it became quite apparent that you couldn't go maybe as hard as what you would been used to. Like I say, mate, I used to, me and Fernando used to kick lumps at each other in training and he probably wouldn't have accepted that in that next season. You could always be competitive, but nothing, nothing too much. If it was in and above the line, then you were struggling. Eh? How can you play for Rangers on a Saturday if you can't attack like that and training Monday to Friday? Well, this is, this is the problem. And I think a lot of the... A lot of the problems at that point was just because we weren't getting results. That was the most, it's the most important thing, obviously, any club, but a club like Rangers, when you're not getting results, you know, it's, it's the worst ever. So boys are desperate to do something to get, to like get the team going, to get that results going and get the, the feel-good factor back. But we just couldn't do it because we didn't sustain enough results. What did Barsley say when he sent him off? Did he just walk in or did he say, like, what the... What, I, I think he's angry, like, basically. Like, what the fuck? And then... He's like, no, go. And he was like, it's all right. So he just went. See, before the Fergie issues, like, could you tell someone was going to, someone massive was going to kick off? Was it, was it on the horizon or how? I think there was, there was bits here and there. I think Fergie'd had hip surgery, so he wasn't playing. And obviously, it was a big loss to the team. So um, he was coming back into training. But I think one of the first incidents was, every Monday, we used to do this mad run. So it was like six laps of the whole Murray Park. It was a 
fucking grind, mate. And it was tough. And you had to do it in a certain time. On a Monday morning? So, it was a Monday morning or a Monday... Mate, it was a Monday afternoon. Like, at like one o'clock we used to train. Or like one o'clock, you'd do this mad 6K run and then you'd go training and your legs were fucked, mate. This was after, after the games on the Saturdays and Sundays. Mental. So, Fergus came back into training and I think one of the first instances was everyone had to do this run in a certain time. Fergie was struggling to do it in the time because he's just back from hip surgery. So he's been, he's just back into training and Le Guin took like, he was saying, well, no, you need to be up, you know, fit if you're not up with the team. And like, Fergie's like, mate, I've been out for like three months. You know, it's my first run back. So that, st- that started off. It was nothing too major, but there was a definite, you could see like there was a possible clash coming there. And then it just sort of manifested itself from there. Eh? And then, what do you remember of the actual incident? The one, what incident are you talking about? The one that he told Fer- he took the captaincy off Fergie. So basically, what happened was I think we played Inverness up in Inverness, and I think we either, I think we lost maybe two one or one all. It was one all draw, but I think it was maybe a loss. It was around about Christmas time, and we came back into the dressing room, and Le Guin sort of. Um, He's not a, he wasn't a rant or a raver in the dressing room, you know, very, very quiet. But we'd just been beat from Inverness. It was, things were going shit anyway. And he's, Le Guin's like, no, no, it's okay, it'll be fine, you know, next week, fine. That was always his, that's always his approach after a game. He was like, no, no, it's fine. We'll be, don't worry, we'll be fine. You were like, and I think a few of the boys at this point had just fucking snapped there. The boys are like, nah, not acceptable. And I think Fergie, obviously, being captain, he's like, it's not acceptable, man. Like, he just because he was so frustrated about not winning for Rangers for our club, he just, he just, like, he was just so frustrated. And he said, No, nah, it's not good enough. You know, we need to do much better. The fact he'd even spoke out was enough for Le Guin just to, he obviously in his mind that, nah. So it was the next couple of days, um, I think, in training when he, when he shipped him of the, the captaincy. So, see, similar to the Rickson incident, like, did you, when Fergie done that after the game, did you not think, like, there's no way that, that that's bad enough for him to be pushed away from the group. Definitely, definitely. Like, we didn't think it was anything that bad. We were obviously just thinking that the captain is caring for the club and it's just frustrated. You know, he's been at the club for years, so he was, like, we didn't think anything too much of it. So when did you first know that, that Le Guin had stripped him of the captaincy? Like, did Fergie come to a meeting and just go to the players like, I've just been stripped? That was it. That was it. So it was after training one day. After that, it just came out the, I think he just came out of the dressing room, uh, out of the manager's office, into the dressing room, and he's like getting his bag and that. And the boy's like, Where are you going? He says, Well, I've just, he just told me I'm no captain anymore. And I think he, I don't know if he told him he'd never play for the club again while he was here or whatever, but he basically says, I'm no captain. I've just been told to leave. We're like, ah, What? Mental. That was the first we knew of it. The first we knew of it was in the dressing room after it. And then did Le Guin speak to the group? No. Nah. So Le Guin didn't speak to the group. What he done was he pulled me about two minutes later. Oh, I mean, like, that's the worst thing. He's packing up. Yeah, I was up like, <laughs> I was like, oh, wow. So he's pulled Fer- me Fer- Fer- Sorry to interrupt you, Gov. Did Fergie give you the death there when you were walking in? No, I think Fergie had left by this point. Like, right. I think Fergie just took his stuff and he's away because he, d- he didn't want to like stay, obviously, in that environment. Yeah. So Eve, the assistant, pulled me like two minutes later and I'm thinking, all right. I was thinking, what the fuck do you want me for? So I went in, and I'd, cap- I'd captained the club a couple of times in, U- in the European games when Fergie wasn't playing, now and again in like the cup games, um, when like the, the main players weren't playing and I was, I was involved. But then he basically just says, I've told uh, Barry he's not captain anymore, and you're going to be the Rangers captain. I'm like, right, okay. <laughs> right, bear in mind, I wasn't even playing. I wasn't, I wasn't even playing in the team, mate. I was thinking, all right. <laughs> like basically are you sure it was just so strange mate it was just like mate fucking you serious come on like amazing like don't get me wrong amazing to have done it but not in a nice not in a nice way this, this sort of situation that happened then. so then so Gov do you need to then go back into the dressing room with the rest of the players after Fergie's just walked out and said lads I'm the new captain <laughs> <laughs> basically basically mate it was mental absolutely mental and we had the mother ball the next day eh I've never been so nervous for a game in my life, right? Because a, I knew I was going to be playing, so I was starting. I'd never, I'd, so I had to obviously concentrate on that because I hadn't been playing. Yeah. Plus, I was captain. Plus, the scrutiny of Barry not being captain—it was fucking mental, mate. Did you sleep the night before that game, there? 
I swear I was proper, like, stressed. and I've never had it in my life. Horrible. But it must have been a good feeling walking out at Ibrox since the Rangers captain, there. Eh? Oh, the, the, the game was at Fur Park. That far, the game the next day was at Fur Park. So it was, don't get me wrong, as I say, an unbelievable, like, honour to do it, but just not in a particularly nice situation where it was just, like, nobody, like, in the press could believe what had happened. None of the fans could believe what had happened. I couldn't believe what had happened. And probably my teammates couldn't believe what had happened. So it was just like, try to just make sure we won the game. Luckily, we won the game. Boydy scored 1-0, I think it was. Um, so that was, that was better, but yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't great, mate. And did, did, uh, did Fergie speak to you after you were given it? Fergie was fine with me, yeah, yeah. He says, oh, listen, mate, obviously, I don't, it's not a debut. I've obviously, go and do your best sort of thing. And um, Yeah, no, there's no, no beef with Fergie at all, no. Right. Uh, aside from the issues, like, was there anything good that came from working with Lagrin? Was there anything that you took from it that was positive? Um, probably not. Not probably not. Um, you know, could have, even looking back at the training and like the coaching, not. I honestly, not. I don't think so, mate. I think it was a an experiment that failed badly and certainly didn't manage to live up to expectations and. I'm probably a bit. I'm probably a bit tinged with it because he fucked off like a few days later and never even said anything. Like he was gone, he resigned, or he was sacked a few days later. Yeah. And then so I never even seen him. Like he never even said, "Oh, listen, sorry." Never even called me after that. Like so, never even said, "Like listen, sorry for putting you in that situation," and you know, wish you all the best for the rest of your career and that. Nothing. So I was just thinking, you fucking prick, man. You put me in that situation. And let me get that scrutiny for three, almost like five days, and then you fucked off. I was like, prick, man. That was fuming, eh? Uh, Jenky telling you to dry it, huh? I think he, he, he manipulated the situation to make, to make it sure he got his exit. Probably the best way to put it. That's not right. Wow. Uh, and then he eventually leaves, and uh, Walter Smith and Alan McCoy's coming. Is that exactly what that, that team needed at that point, Gov? I think so. Yeah, no, I think so. I think... You know, getting the chance. I'd worked with Walter in Coisty with Scotland. Um, so I was I was buzzing, mate. I love Walter. I've got so much respect for him. He's such a legend. Legend, mate. I love him. Um, What's so good about him, girl? What's, really, so What's so good about Walter Smith? It's, it's just his aura, mate. And how he treats you, he's just treats you like a man. But you know you can't cross the line with him either. He's got that aura about him. Um, likes a laugh as well, but you know where you stand with him. Um, I loved working with him. I thought he was great. I loved working with Coisty and Kenny. Um, for that six months and it was the right thing we needed at that time for him to come in and yeah I think the boys were the boys were buzzing What about when he gave uh, Fergie the captain say back did he speak to you beforehand? Ah, he spoke to me beforehand and says listen you know obviously the situation that's gone on and obviously Barry was taken away and um, he wasn't captain but we're going to reinstate, reinstate him as captain I said yeah 100% go for it I mean, without a doubt you know he's he's been the captain for years he knows what he's doing and I have no issue at all. It was, we played Dunfermline in a cup game um, just before Walter came back. So I think Durante was in interim charge at the point. And, mate, we've, so we, the Motherwell game and then all the fallout. And then Le Guin goes. And the, first, the next first game was, and Walter wasn't installed at this point, but so Durante took it. So with a cup game away to Dunfermline. So I was thinking again, just, oh, fucking come on, like, please play well. Just get a good result. Mate, we got pumped. I think it was 3-0. We got absolutely battered from Dunfermline in the cup. Battered, right? <laughs> Before the game, we're staying at a hotel, right? So I'm rooming with Nacho, we Nacho. So went, got the pre-match, came down to the... Um, he said, right, Jan, he's like, go and, get your, go and get your bags and that. Come back on the coach in like 15 minutes and then we'll go for the game. So me and Nacho came down like 15 minutes later. Nay bus, gone. And I'm like, we earlier, we're late. Bus had fucked off. Remember, I'm captain at this point. <laughs> I'm like, this is going to be the worst day ever. Sure enough, get, I had to call him. The bus came back. Me and Nacho gets on the bus, gets to the Vermont game. We got pumped 3 0. Never captain again after that. Fergie was back in, so I was like, yeah. So, were you late? Were you late for the bus? Nah, we were on time, but the bus just fucked off early. It didn't count numbers. <laughs> <laughs> oh, brilliant, man. What about McCoy? Uh, any funny stories, or? Koisky was Koisky's just like a different. He's a different character to what you think. You know, a totally different, different character on the training ground, mate. He's just like proper, proper serious. Takes it, takes it proper serious. And you're just like, 
you'd expect him to like have a laugh, but when he's training, like he's in the zone, and obviously that's how he's managed to sustain a career himself. So yeah, it was um, it was strange seeing like him like from what I knew of course he was question of sport and like how funny he was and all his stories of, from back in the days and that to then seeing him on the training ground he was just like a, a totally different character it was strange to see him like that but it was it's obviously it worked from um he was a, he was a great coach with, with Kenny as well were you, were you offered the chance to stay under Walter Smith I was I was so I had um, I'd been there for three and a half years and that last sort of year and a half I'd been fit and I was sort of in and out of the team and playing now and again and like I said played that Hearts game where I was playing right wing for him. As I say, I would do anything for, for Walter, obviously, he's brilliant. Um, and then, so I scored a couple of goals. And he sort of said, listen, there's an opportunity for you to stay here if you want. I don't know what your, where your head's at, but I'd made up my mind, mate. I was going. I was. I needed to. I needed a fresh start because the three and a half years there, I'd hardly played any games and it was, um, it was just needed a clean break, mate. I needed to get away. What did, he, what, what did Walter say to you after that right midfield performance? Did he just... No mention it. Could you score? Mate, absolutely. Oh, to be fair, he nailed me a bit at half time and I was thinking, fuck, he just asked me yesterday if I could play right midfield. I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> but he was, just, he was more like, mate, like, what the fuck are you doing? Like, calm down. Just relax a bit. Like, all right, all right, all right. I was thinking because I was right mid, I'd have to do like step overs and all that. I was like, mate, come on. <laughs> um, you know, he was, he was, as I say, he was, he was great. I, mean, I love I love water. Brilliant. Uh, obviously, you said you never played enough, but enjoy your time at Ibrox. I, listen, I, I loved being part of a club that big, and you know, I knew obviously Rangers was a big club. I didn't realise how big it was, you know, until you're actually living it day to day and the global reach of the club and the expectation levels is just it's, it's unbelievable. But it's tinged with like a bit of regret, like not getting to sort of enjoy it as much as what I would have loved to, because that's why I went there at that time in my career. That's meant to be the peak of my career, and I didn't really get the chance to enjoy it as much as what I'd have liked. But yeah, and obviously, great to play for them. Oh, and then why Cardiff, mate? So Cardiff, money. I went... Money? No, <laughs> no, well, I had the chance to go to Cardiff or Norwich. So Duff was the assistant at Norwich to Granny. Um, but Dave Jones was chasing my heart. So Dave had signed a few players from Scotland. He always went to the Scotland market quite a lot. And the one thing he said to me, like, it stuck out in my mind. He actually he remembered me from before. And he says, I want you to get back to what you were doing at Dundee, you know. You were a box to box midfielder getting goals and that. And the fact that he knew me and he was really pushing hard was the reason I went. Where I, th- I didn't feel Grant he wanted me as much, but Duff was really keen to get me in. And that's why I chose Cardiff over Norwich at that point. Was it Sam Amanda? Uh, Risdale. Oh, so okay. Sam Amanda had just left. Peter Risdale was there. Oh, I'd love that Sam Amanda story. Uh, best memories at Cardiff, obviously, 2008 final. I was there. Stayed at Kevin McNaughton just the night before. Oh, yeah. Uh, he's played well actually, but there wasn't much in the game, eh? No, nah, it could have went either way, eh? Could have went either way. It was, um, but yeah, man, I've done, you know, looking back at that team they had, fucking some team they had, man. Portsmouth, wow. They had Diara and that played, didn't they? Mate, they had David James, Glenn Johnson, Distan, Saul Campbell, Horiderson, uh, Diara, John, it was mental, mate. Cranshaw, uh-huh. uh, Canu, mate, it was unbelievable. Mentari, Mendes, that was a team, mate, it was mental. Wow. You've done well for me. I remember the game, eh? Yeah, we've done all right. Is done... the game that you thought you could win it? Um, mate, it, was, it, was, it wasn't like much in the game and it was our stupid goalie chucked one in that killed us in the game, man. El- big Enkelman, big lettuce right finger. Oh, right terrible. A shit save and it just fell right at Canu for about two yards out. Yeah. So it was... Um, Disappointing the way we sort of lost it, but it could have went either way. We, we played okay. They didn't play particularly well. It was, a, it was a bit of a shit game overall, but it's one of them that we could have, we could have easy won on the day, um, but just didn't probably do enough. What hurt me? That, that final or the Dundee final? Uh, probably the Dundee final, mate, just because I'd been there as a YTS player coming through. and you know, I've made my journey through the, the club and been there for so long, so probably the Dundee one. Um, because we weren't, although we weren't expected to win the the Dundee Rangers game, you know, we were a championship team that competed against um, Portsmouth as well, so nobody expected us to win that game either. Uh, what about best players you played with in there? Obviously, Peter Whittenham's just passed away. What a player he was in. What, guy, what kind of guy was he? Uh, he was a chilled out, chilled, really chilled out guy. We signed him roughly at the same time. He was, um, yeah, wow, what a player, mate. He was, uh, his left foot was ridiculous and, like, he could run games himself. 
we used to play Old V Young on a Friday and it would be him and Aaron Ramsey were in the young team and mate, they'd be absolutely bossing the old boys. Bossing them, mate. Aaron Ramsey is the best young player I've ever seen um, coming through the ranks. He was outrageous, mate. Outrageous. Well, you could tell he would go right to the top of her. When I signed, so everyone was talking about him, like saying, oh, there's this kid coming through. He's gonna. This is his first year, like pro. Um, you've got to keep an eye on him. He's the new next DVG and all that. I was like, hey, all right, mate, no worries. <laughs> um, and then to the first couple of months, he proper struggled. He struggled to get used to training every day. You know, his body getting used to training every day. See, as soon as he'd done that, mate, he was a joke, mate, honestly. Left fit, right fit, finishing. He could like score, heeding it, big enough, quick enough, everything. He was in space all the time. The best thing he had, mate, that I've, I've never seen from a young lad was just his self-belief, mate, and the mentality and his own ability. Mm. Incredible. No fear. He came on um, right back for McNaughton in the semi-final at Wembley for the FA Cup. And he was like Cafu, mate. He was doing like stepovers and that. The kid's like 16, never played right back in his life, and he was doing like stepovers at Wembley. He was unbelievable, man. Amazing. What about characters that you played with? Didn't there anyone that stands out? Bywater wasn't there, was he? Who? Bywater, was he at Cardiff now? Bywater was there in my last year, yeah, he was, eh? What's he like? Fuck, he was a nutter, eh? He was just like proper, proper intense. Like, you didn't want to like look at him the wrong way, punch fuck at you. I had shit myself with him. You <laughs> said that you had a Stanley knife. No, what was it? A, a pen knife in his pocket. Swiss Army knife, yeah. Uh, mate, mental. So we had him, we had uh, Big John Parkin. Big Parky was there, obviously. He was a big character. Bellers was there the last year with Tom, obviously, the first few years. Uh, you got Mark Stephen Kennedy. Story now. That's not been told. Oh, fucking. It's probably been told, mate. Um, I, the, we, had, we had a good story a, a Stevie Thompson story I don't know somebody's maybe told it but he smashed his guitar I think they maybe told it after being in Liverpool no I don't think so um, so we at Rangers we flew down to um, Liverpool like, we got a private jet down to Liverpool and they did tell you that story no 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 heard this so we were at Rangers and we got a private jet down to, uh, private jet it was like a, a bus with wings basically <laughs> down to Liverpool um <laughs> Thinking we were big bollocks going down to Liverpool, getting a private jet. It was like a little shit, shit height on on wheel on wings, mate. So we got down to Liverpool for the Christmas night out. So we're all there, and um, on the on the night out, the pilot and the, the stewardess guys there are all. They went bumped into them in, in this nightclub, mate. So we're all getting them drinks all night, like they're drinking aftershocks and that all night. The pilot, bearing in mind, we're flying back the next day in the morning. They were out with us all night, right? So the next morning. Had a good night out, brilliant laugh. Next morning, Tom, will usual, get to guitar, into the hotel lobby, early doors, just on the guitar for ages. We get to, we, so we get back to the airport and she's like, we need to get back up the road. Um, that, that flight back up the road was mental, mate. Mental. Big Tom was flying the plane. The, the captain's letting Tom fly the plane. He's got the earphone, the earmuffs on, flying the plane. There's, like, boys are just getting steaming. Big Bob, the hail waves that like, kept shouting out of him. Ah! we're all going to die we're going to crash mate for the whole flight from Liverpool to Glasgow mate mental we get to Glasgow we get back out straight to another another boozer Tom was on the guitar gets out the, out the pub next next thing Tom was just like guitar smashed gone that was it mental the boys were crazy mate. What, uh, what was Bellamy like uh, again? I was shit scared of Bellamy like he's one player that I felt when I was playing with him and training with him, that he thought I was shite. Like, I could sort of feel it from him thinking, he's fucking rubbish, mate. <laughs> In his mind. <laughs> um, really, Bellamy is like, it could be one minute you could be thinking, fuck, he's actually all right. He's a really nice guy. The next minute you're just thinking, fuck, he's a prick, man. You could just, just flip anything, just a ball, a, a pass in training would be off and he'd be, he'd be away, just going on, on one mental. Next minute, totally chilled out. Um, yeah, he was, he was, he was some boy. He was, as I say, like some one minute, I think he's all right. The next minute, I was just thinking he's a bit of a dick. But yeah, he was, he was a good boy. What about Fowler? Fowler was just like one of the last mate. He'd be having bacon egg rolls before training now. Eh? Like just, just a total geezer, mate. Didn't he care? Love that, what a guy. Uh, right, mate. Then you went home, Aberdeen. Uh, Craig Brown, Archie Knox. What were they two shaggers like to work for? <laughs> <laughs> ah, they were great. Um, 
so Craig Brown had uh, gave me my um, debut for uh, Scotland. So I'd, he'd obviously had a relationship with me. He loved me because I was at Dundee. He obviously played for Dundee and that himself. So I'd always, always had a good relationship with him. I was maybe going there in the January, but I remember going there in the summer, but I didn't go until the January. Um, so eventually got up there. I can just remember like some days we would just go for bacon rolls and I like some days they would just like Archie's like oh, fuck it we'll just go for bacon rolls mate it was um, but the problem the problem was we weren't doing that well so we we're like well we should really be a bit of training like so sometimes you'd be like we should maybe just go training but ah, mate great times I love working with the both, both of them they were great did Archie still crack at that age? oh big time mate yeah big time yeah now he's still crack like you wouldn't uh, he wouldn't um, hold back, and I think you know everyone's. He used to after the game, he'd be talking to you, so you could get beaten. That he'd be talking to you, and you'd be getting changed like in the shower quickly, and you'd be getting changed. You come out of the shower. He always used to put his shoes and socks on first, and then he'd be like toweling off with his shoes and socks on, pure stalkers, like slaughtering the boys. You know, fucking hell, you can't take him serious. He was brilliant. That's amazing, man. Uh, and then uh, Dale McInnes came in laterally. Could you tell? Could you tell Dale's quality straight away? I love Dale. I think he's a great guy. Yeah. yeah no, I've got a lot of time for Dale. Even though he released me, um, I've got a lot of time for him. Mate. He was uh, he was proper straight up with me. You know, when it came, I was coming to the end of my contract, and he says, "Now listen, it's a really tough one, but you know, I want to put my own sort of stamp on the squad." He says, "Mate, no, no worries." Like, I mean, I played against Dale, knew, knew Dale for years, and he's done a he's done a fantastic job up there. It's um, it's tough to keep replicating doing so well with the players leaving but he's a he's a good really good manager and then back to Dundee mate was it always in your mind to kind of finish your career at Dundee it wasn't mate to be honest I mean I'd finished up at Aberdeen and sort of contemplated emigrating at that point um, it was always in the plan sort of to emigrate to Australia so I was going to go but then Bomber was the manager at Dundee and he sort of convinced me and it was a couple of things so it was finishing my career where I started but also um, club captain. So I was not just captain of, like, pure club captain for everyone, which was, at that point, I was ready for. Plus, I was um, the reserve team manager. So there's a few things there that sort of helped. And plus, I could still stay in Aberdeen. So I travelled down with Boyle every day, and that's how I'm close with Boyle. Um, so me and him used to travel down every day. So it, was, it just worked out. I just thought, you know what? I mean, why not? I've put moving away for a while, putting moving Australia off for a while. So one more year, let's, let's have a crack at it. Could, uh, could Bomber be a bit eccentric? Uh, Bomber was... But, you know, Bomber's, like, the pre-season was amazing, mate. We hardly got any running. It was all football. It was brilliant, eh? But it I said really... that. Show you if you were running too fast in the running. Oh, it was mental, eh? It was so strange, like, it was weird, but... Because you expect him to be going nuts, but he was... Um... No, it was good. He, he, got, he put together a really good squad, and some of the signings were great and really pushed us on, but... He was um, sometimes bomber. He would just say, "Ah, fucking, you know, tactics don't matter. It's not a day with tactics." Even though, like, we'd been set up in tactics for the two days pre- pre- previous to the game, ah, tactics don't matter and all that. So you're like, "Fucking hell, is it? Is it, is it one thing or other?" So, uh, but nah, I, as I say, I, he brought me back to that club, and I've got a lot of thank him for, and I love bomber as well. And then, how good was that, mate? Winning the championship with him in your last season. I mean, it couldn't have been better. It actually couldn't have worked out better. It was uh, especially the way it happened on the last day, um, and with a really good group of boys. And just because I had, because we got promoted, I'd had another. I got another year in my contract. You know, it kicked in automatically. But I was just thinking, fuck, it's, it's just not going to get better. Now I could play in the Premier League. I've done that already. I could be on the bench, no playing. I could get injured. You know, being able to sort of retire myself yeah. was definitely the best way for me to finish. Like I could just take that decision and just go out on a high. And winning the league on the last day was it was amazing, mate. Amazing. And I need to ask you a last question on Dundee. The Magaluf trip at the end of the season. Ibiza. You were going to batter my, Ibiza, sorry, my big mate Sean Morrison, weren't you, for Cardiff? Oh, mate, wow. What is he all about? <laughs> He's a loose cannon, isn't he? <laughs> wow. He was, um, yeah, we were at that Ocean Beach Club one day. It was the day we were there all day and he was like, he proper come up to boys and like he like he was trying to be friendly, but he was like proper aggressive, like right up in your face, like by being friendly. And then he was sucking somebody's toes, and I'm like, "What the fuck's going on here, man?" He's just not. Nah. And I'd got to the point. I was like, "Mate, you need to get the fuck away from here. You're doing my nothing there." And was then you, was you know Colin Declan Gallagher, Meta Saka? <laughs> but he was there with big Heidi. He was there with Jake Hyde. So Heidi's his play, and Heidi used to play with Dundee. So we all knew. We all knew Heidi. Uh-huh. So all the boys were sort of together, but 
he was just like, he was a screwball. But I know he's, obviously I know a few of the boys at Cardiff are really good friends and he says he's a great lad. I don't know, I've never met him apart from that day. Um, but he was, yeah, he was on one that day, he was mental. He's a top man. And did, uh, did Martin Boyle not have a bit of a breakdown as well when he thought everyone hated him? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we, um, we, got to this, we got to this brand new hotel. So it was all inclusive. We only just booked it because we just won the league a few days before. Club were very kind to us, booked it. I'd put it in our contracts. Like if, we, if we got promoted, we'd get a, a trip away at the end of the season. So they, they, they came through with it. It was brilliant. Um, so we booked this hotel. It was all inclusive. A brand new hotel. So it was like they didn't even know what had hit them because it was only open like two weeks. And then all of a sudden, you've got a group of 20 boys, all inclusive for Scotland. Just absolutely drank the place dry, mate. They had to keep going to the off-license to get mere booze to put behind the bar for us to take. <laughs> they, they had to, like, they were trying to cap it, and we are like, nah, nah, you can't cap it. It's, this is, this is <laughs> a deal. But I think because after that, after we'd been there, they totally changed their policy because we absolutely killed them, <laughs> eh? Because we absolutely drunk him dry. But the first day we got there, we, Boyley, thought he was, thought he was being a hard man, drinking Jaeger bombs that day, right? So we are like, mate, like, settle, settle down. We're just here. Relax yourself. Just relax, take it easy, have a beer. And he's like, nah, I'm going to and Jaeger bombs all day. I'm like, Boyley, come on, mate. So we'd had a few drinks. We went for something to eat. We came back to the hotel. He's still there drinking Jaeger bombs at this point. And we're like, Boyley, where are you then? Like, and I says, mate, you're going you're gonna to end up like, you're going to need your stomach pumped. Right? You need to calm down. Just settle down. Go in here, sleep, and then come back out with us like, later on. And then all of a sudden, I turned around and he's in tears. And I'm like, what the fuck was wrong with you? You all right? He was just an emotional wreck because he'd been on the Jaeger bombs that day. <laughs> oh, amazing, man. He loves that, isn't it? Jaeger. Do you want a Jaeger? That guy. <laughs> yeah. uh, right, mate, just the last wee bit. Uh, now, obviously, over in Australia, and if anyone's seen Gov's missus, they'll understand why he moved over there. Uh, <laughs> are you, are you going to stay over there, or is there an ambition to come back here, be a coach, manager? It's enough. As I say, I've been coaching here for about five years, nearly six years now. Um, Never say never, you know, football in the UK, there's definitely a lot more opportunities than, than there is in Australia. So it's, uh, I'm coaching part-time at the moment. It's been really good in terms of experience and dealing with budgets and players and stuff. If someone came up in the, in the, in the UK, then, you know, I'd certainly they'd have to look at it, but it would have to be right for the family first. Um, but we'll see if you never say never, mate. Gavin Ray, Dundee manager, get that flat in the hill tune back. <laughs> <laughs> Gavin, man, thanks very much, mate. Loved it. No worries. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Bye, Nero. Cheers.